From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. The German Air Force leaks Ukraine plans through WebEx. Former Google engineer indicted for stealing AI secrets for the Chinese companies. And Cloudflare starts up the AI firewall war. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have selected from this past week's cybersecurity headlines. And it was, a, it was a doozy of a week. We had to do some very careful curation. But now we have them all ready, and we're going to get some insight, opinion, and expertise from our returning guests. It's, it's, been a, it's been a while, all the way August 2022. David Cross, the SVP and CISO over at Oracle. David, thank you so much for making the time. I know you're busy. Appreciate uh, being here. Rich, it's great to be back, and I see you've got a jacket you to match me here for this episode. I am. I'm, I'm matching the energy. I'm, I'm putting out the same level of professionalism uh, that I can only hope to aspire to. So thank you so much for classing up the joint. Truly appreciate it. Also class up the joint, our sponsor for today, Conveyor market-leading AI for automating customer security reviews. You can class us up, up too by joining us on YouTube Live. Do so, go to CISOseries.com, hit the events dropdown, look for the Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review image. That's how you can keep up to date on all of our events that are going on. Check us out every single week. See who our guests are gonna be. We have some fantastic guests already lined up and announced, so be sure you're heading over there and checking that out. And once you're watching us, join in on the chat. We wanna hear your comments, your questions, your concerns. I'll even say constructive criticism during the show. Uh, destructive criticism, please uh, put that in a text uh, browser and then just delete it. Uh, but we will try our best to address them during the show where relevant and we'll have some fun. We've got about 20 minutes though. So let's just jump right into the news here. First appear, German Air Force under fire for non-encrypted Ukraine discussions overheard by a little place called Russia. Filed this under Reisender Chinander, thank you, uh, uh, Germany. Uh, some embarrassment and outrage in Germany after Russian media published a conversation amongst German Air Force senior officials about the possibility of deploying Taurus long range missiles in Ukraine and training pilots and operators there. Rather than being a sophisticated hack on the part of Russian intelligence, something uh, we, we know is in their capability. It was reported separately by German news agencies that the recordings came from using a non encrypted WebEx connection. To be clear, it was just one high-ranking official rather than the, you know, like a systemic failure, but they were dialing in from Singapore, either on a cell phone or through the hotel's Wi-Fi. So David, although just one person, you know, we, we just want to make sure we're clear on that, seems like kind of a major slip up in security, especially given what's at stake with this war. I'm curious, what's your take on this? You know, Rich, I don't know all the details, but I must admit, you know, as a you know military veteran, I'm really shocked, right, that we're actually seeing a government or military organization that's not following procedures, they're not following their playbooks, which are normally very, very strict, right, so that you that prevents these type of things from ever occurring. So, I think it's a very interesting case to really kind of do that root cause analysis and understand, you know, what other procedures may not be being followed and what other security gaps may exist because this is really what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, we've had guests on this show that have had to go through their security teams to clear, you know, the VoIP connection for this. So, you know, I have to like the, the what make, makes me think is what are the organizational factors that might be allowing someone to to, you know, throw up over hotel Wi-Fi? Is it is it, you know, a high ranking officer that's, you know, uh, threatening to raise heck if uh, if they don't get connected right away or something like that? CCL in the chat may be playing some uh, 4D chess here. What if they knew the enemy was listening? Um, I think that's maybe clever by half, but you never know. Well, I love the idea, right? It's the disinformation, right? You know, that is going out. It can be played very well. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as long as they don't mind a little egg on their face in the media, uh, maybe that'll help Russia buy it, you know, for sure. All right. Next up here, former Google engineer indicted for stealing AI secrets from Chinese or for Chinese companies. 38 year old Chinese national Lin Wei Ding was charged in, uh, uh, charged on Tuesday by a federal jury in San Francisco with four counts of thefts of trade secrets, specifically that he stole detailed information about the hardware infrastructure and software platform. That lets Google supercomputing data centers train large AI models through machine learning, kind of a, a big deal these days. Ding allegedly began his thefts in 2022 while being approached to become chief technology officer for an early stage Chinese company. So David, this 
must be one of the biggest fears of any CISO, not knowing whether an employee can be trusted. Classic. I mean, this is this is the the worst insider threat, you know, uh, a nightmare out here. Uh, I'm I'm curious, how do you go about uh, uh, addressing that risk? And I guess what advice would you offer to CISOs as they you know look around their own hires? You know, I think this one's particularly kind of challenging, right? It's certainly we've seen it occur in the past, right? And I think that you know. We're looking at you know uh, employees, right? We most of the cloud providers, like we all know that the background checks are being conducted, right? Especially the cloud providers are doing this. We're doing lots of valuations, but so how do you really evaluate, you know, what risks may exist with a given talent, right? You know, we know that there's the other extreme, right? You know, for especially in the you know the government clouds, right? Where you've got you know clearances and polygraphs, but those are very intrusive, right? They're very expensive, right? Um, and a lot of people don't get qualified, you know, on that. So I think that the hard question is, which I don't really know the answer is, what's the right balance, right? You know, be, be having that, uh, the having a risk assessment of a given individual without being biased, right? Without the high cost, right? But still really how you can identify what might be a malicious insider and maybe should not be in a given role. Yeah. I, I, and I think we're, we're beginning to like get to a point where, you know, we, we, we have behavior analysis. We, you know, we see what, what aberrant behavior is looking like we're seeing increasingly AI models being able to, to contribute to that once they're in your network, but yeah, getting to that point of, of at that point of hire, obviously you, you would prefer to do that mm -hmm. before they do any potentially malicious activity. And yeah, that, that balance of, Hey, we, we want to bring in the best people. Uh, we don't want to. We don't want to turn away talent. Uh, uh, you know, unnecessarily. Um, I, I think is is definitely going to be an interesting conversation. You know that. You know, uh, uh, keep them out of the perimeter uh, is is a is a much bigger challenge uh, for sure. And uh, you know, we we see Google getting bit right here. Um, and you know, David Spark asked the question: Who doesn't like to steal AI secrets? Mm -hmm. um, if you ask China, uh, nobody. Evidently, I'm sure anybody would take them if they were given to them. Yeah. To be fair. Well, I guess this is where we need the AI, right, to detect everything, right? And I think that's, you know, we, the humans, right? So that we have to have the AI to protect us, to attack us. Oh, maybe I didn't say that. <laughs> we need to stack all the AI turtles so that we can no longer see the floor. That is that is my uh, ongoing hypothesis with all things AI. It's all AI turtles for now until eternity. <laughs> yeah. All right, next up here, uh, HP offers printer subscription that uh, they get to monitor. Last week on the show, we discussed a vending machine that appeared to have a facial recognition data collection app built in. And now it appears that HP, a name synonymous with printing as M&M's is to candy, is offering an as-a-service relationship to SMB customers that allows HP to monitor what is being printed, ostensibly to match its customers up with advertisers and potentially combine information about you with information from other companies. So I guess printers with special offers is uh, how we'll refer to this. At first glance, there seems to be a lot of things wrong with this plan. Perhaps it's uh, orientation doesn't quite paint a portrait of, uh, of the customer landscape. Like it, it, if this could provide value, I guess, to those SMBs, maybe. But, I, you know, David, where did where would your concerns lie first year? Oh, boy, I'm still struggling with this one. As soon as I heard it, I'm like, I'm looking over my laser jet right now, right? It's like, I love it, right? And I want to know, hey, when the, the color is going to run out, that's great. Because I don't want to be caught like I got to print this and I don't have it got to go to Home Depot or, you know, or, anyways, but like, in the end, they're going to understand what I'm printing, you know, what are they trying to achieve here, right? What's the real benefit, right? Uh, to the consumer? What's the benefit to me that you know what I'm printing? Right. And so I have to ask myself is that did their security product managers honestly believe that customers would love them to monitor, you know, what they're printing and then they're going to pay for that at the same time? I'd really question myself on this one. Well, well and it's, I mean, I, what I'm envisioning is it's essentially very similar to search ads, right? You search for birthday candles, mm -hmm. you get party center ads in your, your Google searches or something like that. So it's like, okay, I'm printing up flyers for an event I'm doing as a business or something like that. And it's going to suggest associated services mm -hmm. to me. But I, I feel like it, like if, if those ads are useful to you, and arguably they are in search, like it's going to do a worse job because it has a way less visibility and it feels a thousand times creepier. Like, oh, like this is, this did not pass, like no, no, no human approved this policy. I can't, I can't see. It. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Farrell suggests time to get rid of my HP printer office space style. This is for <laughs> new printers for SMBs. To be fair, uh, I have owned HP printers in the past. I probably will in the future. Yeah. Hey, I have a small business as well, but you could like, I'm involved in an acquisition or something like that. And they see it. That's not insider information. Hmm. I don't know. 
Yeah, I would I would need to see all of the like the white paper of how you're anonymizing this, how you're doing that, like whatever matching you're doing, like you need this needs to be full transparency for anybody to be on board or they're giving away these printers for free and no one reads the fine print and oops, I'm opted into this either way. <laughs> all right, next here, fake online meetings used to spread malware. Researchers from Zkaler's Threat Labs, with a Z, come on, Zscaler, found a threat actor that is utilizing fake Skype, Google Meet, and Zoom meetings to distribute malware targeting both Android and Windows users. By creating convincingly similar websites hosted on typo squatted sites, the attackers aim to spread rat type malware. You know, so in a way, this is very much a, a typical run of the mill spoofing crime, but the twist being the pressure of attending yet another meeting where logging on and unmuting oneself is difficult enough without having to scrutinize the URL. We've seen this setup before, so what can we do to help people avoid getting caught up in this type of scam? Well, you know, I first wonder, is anyone actually still using uh, Skype? But, oh, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> But I have to admit, from what I'm seeing, for both like all the training that companies are doing, right, and the actual phishing, that's you know the spear phishing I'm seeing, right? Yeah, it's the uh, it's the Zoom meetings, the Google Meet meetings, because I get a gazillion a day, you know, because that's what I do, that's our business, right? And so I think people kind of get a little desensitized right now. It's like, oh yeah, here's another meeting, here's another meeting, and you know, you get so many, you're so used to it, then you're going to naturally click it because. That, that's what you're doing all day. So I think this is really a great example where people need to, you know, get that additional awareness, right? So knowing that this is number one. So it's, it's, it's that you weren't expecting before and, but you've got so desensitized and they need to watch out and look at them and maybe companies not need to start doing more personalization, right? And labeling of these. So you know that, okay, this came from outside the company. This is a zoom meeting that I was not expecting. I need to look much closer. Is, is it a matter of, putting more friction between that that email and and just clicking accept because I do that for every meeting or uh, like it because I feel like, it, you know, make it too inconvenient. And everybody just works around it because, hey, I need to be on my ninth sales call today. Yeah, I think that's a challenge, right? We, we get so many. We're so dynamic. We're so moving, right? That why would you ever need to check it before? So but all it takes is once and you're burned quite you know severely. Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, yeah, kind of a. I, I still feel like even though you know, 2020, we we saw kind of all the stories with Zoom bombing and and all the, these types of approaches. Still feels like we don't have a great answer for that, and that these kind of things will keep yeah. popping up as long as it's easy enough to do. You know, there there there's a good return on that uh, that malware investment for mm -hmm. sure. All right, uh, before we move on to our next story, we have to spend a few moments and thank our sponsor for today, Conveyor. Conveyor is the AI security review automation platform helping InfoSec teams automate everything from securely sharing a SOC 2 to one-click autofilling security questionnaires in OneTrust so you can spend almost zero time on the manual tasks that make you want to throw your computer out the window. Teams are finding in a free proof of concept that Conveyor's AI is better than the rest. Learn more at conveyor.com. Mention this show for five free questionnaire credits when you purchase an enterprise plan. All right, next up here, the U.S. Treasury issues its first spyware sanctions. The government announced sanctions against the founder and another executive at the spyware company Intellexa. The Treasury justified the sanctions by saying that Intellexa developed spyware that targeted Americans, including government officials and journalists, which is a uh, it's a good way to get on a lot of people's bad sides. The sanctions also impacted a group of companies that resell Intellexa spyware in different countries, and this includes the developer of Predator spyware, Citrox Holding ZRT. So David, Intellexa and Predator have been in the news this week alongside uh, NSO Group and Pegasus. Clearly seems to be, you know, uh, powerful technologies that despite, you know, the stigma, uh, listen, they, they, they're working for their clients. Do you think these sanctions will do anything? Well, I think it's kind of exciting or in a positive way, right? You know, government, you know, governments and industry are really kind of, they're getting aligned and we're now acknowledging that these spyware companies are generally just not in the common interest of the world, right? And they're abused more and more by malicious, you know, organizations versus, you know, some, you know, organizations that have best interest, you know, trying to fight terrorism or things like that. You know, and I haven't asked him, but like one of my you know, friends and colleagues, you know, at Google, you know, Shane Huntley is like really been driving. It's like, these things are bad, right? We need to get rid of these. We can't tolerate these. Right. And so I think we're going to see more and more, you know, kind of rejection and more sanctions of these companies and really, really people just kind of rejecting this. And I think that's in our interest. I just really don't see the need and uh, the, the exception like we did, you know, many years ago. 
yeah, it's, it, like seeing that this is a yeah a business model that you know as a as a society as a as a as a, pop, as a global population yeah. that we're just going to say, um, yeah, the the juice isn't worth the the squeeze or you know because every single time NSO whoever it is uh, you know Intellexa says we only work with you know we vet all our government clients da 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 and then inevitably reports come out that. Uh, you know, uh, other people are getting saying, you know, are, are getting caught up in it. It's getting, you know, out there in some ways. Uh, yeah. So definitely we'll see if we get some more um, some more legislative juice on this and, and uh, to see if we get some more international cooperation on this for sure. Yeah. You'll definitely see me. I'll be the last person that says we need more legislation. But this is one of the things like we say, we just can't tolerate this. It's not in the interest of the world. Yeah. And, and I, I only say that because, you know, uh, sanctions only, you know, and I, I think this with executive orders, sanctions, these only survive administrations and when we see that that means there is some some general accord about that so uh, uh hopefully some long lasting change on that uh, next up here online fraud hits record losses the fbi's latest internet crime report for 2023 is out and the numbers show 12.5 billion dollars lost to online fraud last year that's up 22 percent from the year before to put that into perspective 12.5 billion dollars could I don't know, cover Netflix subscriptions for uh, about 106 or for about six, seven million years, give or take, you know, depending on if you get the HD tier or not. Just enough time to figure out what's going on in Stranger Things or BoJack Horseman. You get all caught up. Investment fraud accounted for the highest losses at $4.57 billion, but the report also notes a rise in complaints related to ransomware and business email compromise scams, some of the classics. So, David, perhaps an increase in crime is not a surprise given no. human nature, but Perhaps it is a surprise, given the amount of efforts we've seen put in by government organizations like CISA, as well as cybersecurity professionals everywhere to combat it. I, how do we contextualize when we see reports and figures like this? Well, I think it's clear that, you know, just talking about secure by default, talking about secure by design, you know, we've seen CISA and others are all, you know, putting out reports and guiding and recommending. But I think the reality, it's not enough, right? We, we need to, we much, we much, we must start much earlier. We must kind of build this knowledge, the insights and the training much earlier in all computer science professionals, right? And so very recently, you know, uh, I'm a member of the IT ISEC, you know, the, the critical SAS special interest group, right? And mm -hmm. we kind of put out the call, right? It's saying that, hey, universities, accredited programs and training that we want cybersecurity to become part of every program, every degree in all classes in the futures. We don't want to be just an optional individual thing, right? For one reason, but we want this to become an element just like DevSecOps, right? Because we think that we, if we don't do this in everything that we we do in cyber, you know, in, in computer science and uh, the software industry, we're not going to make a difference. So we have to start early. Let's start making the call and um, you know, let's reach out and make others kind of join us. Yeah, that's a really great point to make that, you know, make cyber, you know, uh, secure development kind of the, the reflexive default, right? As opposed to, oh man, I got to, you know, refactor everything or, you know, I, I got to send this to another team or this is, this is an impediment if you make it part of that build process and, and, and make it kind of the common sense. Uh, yeah. I think that's, uh, that, that's kind of how you get long-term change on this uh, for sure. That's, yeah, that's, that's great to be involved in that. That's awesome. All right. Our next story here, definitely uh, uh, we're seeing a lot of, of fallout, a lot of people impacted by this, but change healthcare attack causing cash flow issues was, was the one that really stood out to me this week. Fallout from a cyber attack generally involves, you know, we usually talk about it like IT infrastructure outages, or we're talking about data loss, that kind of stuff. But the recent change healthcare attack has resulted in major cash flow issues for hospitals and pharmacy networks to the tune of what some analysts estimates as $100 million a day in deferred revenue, aka they get paid. This is also causing major grief to patients and healthcare professionals dealing with shortages, outages, delays, possible furloughs, like the, like the list goes on. So David, this makes dealing with the crisis, you know, kind of a business continuity issue and social concern more than just a cyber attack, you know, that we, that we are more versed in dealing with. Obviously this isn't the first cyber attack to have business continuity implications, but uh, it seems like it's, it has a, a really wide reach for a lot of organizations. Do you feel that, we, you know, uh, need to be reminded more strongly about, you know, these kind of serious threats. Uh, you know, do we do we need to, uh, you know, kind of bring hospital executive regulators, government agencies and like the, the spread of an attack like this, I guess. 
Yeah, so it kind of made me think about it. It was actually recently, um, uh, you know, a university asked you to, to actually kind of create a lecture and they want to talk about cyber resilience. And I think this is exactly the message here, right? Is that all companies really need to kind of plan and prepare and you know, test for resilience, right? It's no longer just like, Hey, a plan for a compromise, assume you've been breached, right? And then just the impact, you know, on your resources, how much time it takes to remediate the attack, right? It's now, and I think this is a great example, it's the overall impact on the business and its continuity, right? Which then affects your operations, it affects your cash flow. And this is so very important. And this goes me way back in my career is, you know, working and, uh, uh, working with a an airplane manufacturer, right? And you know we're talking about actually using Windows ninety five, you know, in an embedded manufacturing system. And so th imagine that being on the factory floor, right? And something goes wrong or it reboots. I'm saying, well, hey, the rivet, the wing riveting machine, it it costs a hundred or a million dollars an hour if that goes down. They're like, wow, resilience is critical here, right? And I think that's the what we're facing now. People thinking about it, it's just about a vulnerability. It's about the resilience of your business. If there is a vulnerability, is there is there a zero day? Is there an attack? How are you going to recover from that? Or not just how you can recover, but how can you keep operating? And I think that's the real question here. Yeah, and and I, obviously this gets into a much wider point, but I, I really feel the more I am seeing this conversation turning to resilience, that I mean, obviously that is that is a business wide conversation, and that's really we, we talk about the role of CISOs and how you know they play in, in org charts and stuff like that, and that's really. I think where they can connect all of the things that you know sometimes you know can get lost in techno babble and stuff to really connect that to the to these you know to connect cyber risk to you know the core functionality of the business and and I think get more investment and and get more awareness of of how these you know cybersecurity are is going to impact other aspects like I think it, it is definitely both ways but I, I think there is. Uh, I, I'm definitely seeing like a shift in in that being like a, a great way to to pivot those conversations from something purely technical or purely cyber risk driven to like, hey, let's let's talk about the business here. All right, and our last uh, discussion for today, Cloudflare announces LLM Security Solution. The company's new firewall for AI aims to provide a layer between potential threat actors and an LLM, serving to identify potential attacks or malicious prompts before they go out. The new firewall deploys in front of any LLM on Cloudflare's existing workers' AI solution. The idea being, it could block something like a prompt injection uh, threat at scale without human intervention. So I know this sounds like a like a another product announcement, but I, I think this category of, you know, kind of securing, controlling access to these AI models is really interesting. And it's Cloudflare, they're, they're a big player uh, with, with a lot of, uh, you know, kind of across IT here. So I, I think this is this is kind of notable. I'm curious, David, what are your feelings about, you know, fast learning technologies being empowered with the ability to, to kind of, you know, fight without human interaction where, you know, kind of protecting from from these kind of threats. Well, I think there's two things here. One is certainly the reality is AI is here forever, and we're going to have AI everywhere. To not have AI is almost going to be unthinkable in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. But the other element is, I think, is we kind of you know kind of came to thought here is that who will watch the watchers, right? So everything's going to have AI, but then what AI is going to watch the AI, right? And I think that's going to be interesting. Are we going to have superior AI? Are we going to have, um, you know, trusted AI and all other AI is not trusted? So I think there's a lot of things are emerging here. And uh, it's going to be fascinating to, you know, see the uh, the years ahead. And certainly, I think RSA is coming up here pretty soon. Boy, we're gonna have a lot of stories to tell pretty soon. <laughs> and the CCL in our chat says a network firewall, application firewall, and now LLM mm -hmm. firewall. I mean, that that seems to be the order of the day. Yeah, I, I was reading an article uh, earlier this week about like, how do you even red team, you know, a, a large language model? Like, like the, a lot of the security concepts that we have just, there is no direct parallel to a lot of these things. And it, that's what makes it exciting. I mean, not just from the, you know, what we can use this technology for, but like, it, it does feel, you know, like, uh, hey, uh, it's, a, you know, a Tim Berners-Lee uh, internet in the next machine kind of moment, uh, except every trillions of dollars are being spent on it. So a little bit different scale there, but very exciting times for sure. Before we get out of here, David, was there any story that was a favorite of yours or made your eyes roll back? Thumbs up or an eye roller for you? Well, I still, I can't, I'll bring up the story about my jacket here. People answer, why did I wear it? So it was on a keynote a number of years ago. And uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, speaking with uh, General Colin Powell, who's no longer with us. And as a military veteran and things like that, I was honored to meet him and talk with him. And he had just one thing to say said, Mr. Cross, nice jacket. I'll remember that for the rest of my life. And I'm going to keep this jacket as long as I can. 
<laughs> well, that gets a, a hearty thumbs up uh, from me uh, because I mean, I would just wear that every single day uh, <laughs> if I had that story to tell. So thank you so much, David Cross, the SVP and CISO over at Oracle. Keeping busy over there, making some time for us. Truly appreciate it. Where can people find you online if they want to follow what you're up to? Oh, definitely. I have my travel blog, davidcrosstravels.com. You can find me on LinkedIn and uh, I look forward. Well, actually, you can see me here almost every Friday whenever I can, Rich, as I would like to be one of the commenter uh, on the, the Headlines show. Exactly. You are there with CCL, with Kevin Farrell, with uh, with our own David Spark, the other David, as we like to call him, uh, yeah, keeping the chat lively. So if you have not joined us in the chat, you need to be in there. Lots of good stuff. And we always appreciate it. We also appreciate our sponsor for today, Conveyor, market leading AI for automating customer security reviews. Thanks again to everybody in our audience. We truly appreciate uh, your time spending it with us. We hope uh, this has been enjoyable, get something out of it. I really enjoyed today's conversation. Hope you did as well. We'll be back next week with another Super Cyber Friday. This one is gonna be hacking security driven sales, an hour of critical thinking about how to unlock revenue with your security program. And we'll have another week in review show, so make sure you are tuning into that and you can get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines. Every single day, give us about six minutes. We'll get you all caught up. Until the next time we meet, I'm Rich Straffolino, reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.